What is up guys, Blue Spooky here with another two hour long mega mix. I saw a lot of you guys commenting that you enjoy these longer vids with more new stories, so I'll try to put out at least one every week or so. Whenever I have some extra time to record, I'll record some more stories and put those to the side to use for these sorts of things. If you guys do enjoy these longer videos of new stories, please be sure to leave comments, like, share, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. This last mega compilation did really well because you guys did all that, and that really helps the video appear in the algorithm. These longer videos take a lot more time to make, several hours in fact, so if you guys appreciate that extra effort, please be sure to show your support as much as you feel comfortable with. Thank you guys so much for watching, and without further ado, I will get straight into the new stories. I was 11 and lived in a suburb on the outskirts of a relatively peaceful area. At least, I don't ever remember hearing any gunshots or seeing any violence or anything like that in my neighborhood. Everybody I knew was pretty simple. They were hard-working people just trying to get by. Most would give you the shirt right off their back if you needed it. And this took place on a cool fall day in 2007. I had been playing games at a friend's house most of the day. At about 5pm, I went back home to have dinner. And after eating, I returned to my friend's house. I had to leave because of some family trouble. Now, I found myself alone and pretty bored. As I walked aimlessly around the yard, I caught sight of some kittens playing in the bushes. At this time, I was infatuated with cats. I loved playing with them, petting them. This got me clawed up on several occasions, but my love for them had never been lost. I think this was around the time I told my mom I wanted to be a veterinarian, it wouldn't be until I grew older that I found out the downside of that profession. Anyway, I ran after the kittens and followed them into the bushes. I was crawling around on my hands and knees looking for them when I heard the squeal of tires off in the distance. Soon after the squeal was a popping noise. I assumed at first someone was playing with firecrackers or something and went back to my searching. Maybe a few seconds later though, I heard the squealing again, and it sounded much closer now. Another group of pops went off. I thought that they may be over on the next street. Only now did I stop what I was doing and peek out from the bushes. Our house was second to last from the corner, and I could see everyone and everything that passed by on that cross street. Off in the distance, I could see a car speeding in my direction. An automobile, an SUV of some sort was following close behind, and the popping noises grew really close now. As the car approached our street corner, it began swerving around. It took a hard turn and crashed into a neighbor's flower bed next to a stop sign. Now I was fixated on every move. I watched with fascination. I waited for someone inside the car to get out but no one was moving. I was beginning to get concerned. Not even 10 seconds passed before the SUV pulled up and stopped right by. A tall man with a beanie and a sweater jumped out and ran up to the crashed car. The man had something in his hand, but I couldn't see exactly what it was. I assumed he was going to help the guy, but I was wrong. Instead, he ran up to the driver's side door raised his hand, and I heard a loud series of bangs. I saw a bright flash and realized those pops I'd been hearing were gunshots. I had just witnessed a cold-blooded murder. I didn't dare to move for fear this man would hear me. In hindsight, he was probably too focused on this terrible act to even realize I was nearby. As he turned to run away, I heard him say something about cutting people off. I didn't realize this had something to do with driving. This was probably some type of road rage incident. I didn't realize this until I was much older, though. After he'd fired several shots into the car, the SUV driver ran back to his vehicle 
and sped off. I waited until he was gone before I crawled out of the bushes and ran to my house. I blurted out what I had just seen to my mom. I was talking so fast that she couldn't even understand me, so I grabbed her by the hand and dragged her outside. When we got there, I pointed at the car. By now, some of the neighbors were looking around the car as well, trying to help somehow. My mom dragged me back inside and called 911. The police and emergency services soon arrived, and the cops began asking questions. When they got to us, my mom said she thought she had seen the crash. At this point, no one but a few people knew the truth. I told the cop what I'd seen. My mom freaked out. She started yelling at me about lying. The officer took her aside and told her it appeared that I was telling the truth. My mom panicked and yelled at me about my safety and things like that. After that, I gave a description of the man to the police. They left, and for the next few weeks, my mom would not let me out of her sight. I only learned later that there were discussions about me actually testifying in court. Even after the guy was caught, it was a possibility. I can't imagine the testimony of an 11-year-old would have much credibility in court, but that's what my mom told me. Ultimately, the guy took a plea and admitted to the crime. I still didn't have much freedom until I was in my late teens. Honestly, I doubt the guy had any clue anyone had actually seen him. About five years ago, I looked further into the incident and discovered the guy had been killed in a prison fight soon after. As for the driver of the car, he was a mechanic and had been test driving a newly repaired car when he was murdered. It's certainly a sad story but I suppose you could say his killer got his just desserts in the end. I'm a woman, and this happened when I was still in high school. My friends and I used to like to go to the high school football games on Friday nights. We would watch our friends play in the game. There was a really large student section in the bleachers, and it was always a really good time. I would then hang out with my friends afterward. One time, I went with two of my friends to a high school football home game. Where I'm from, the high school football games are always a huge deal. Just about the entire town shows up, and it's always packed. Our team is usually pretty good as well. We went into the student section during the game. We mostly stayed there, but a couple of times we got up and walked around a bit. It was very crowded. After the game, we hung around for a while, and then we were going to leave to go to one of my friend's houses. We were going to spend the night there. She lived about 10 minutes away. I was driving, so we all hopped into my car and then started to leave. There was a big traffic jam, so it took 10 minutes just to get off the main street. Once we'd made it through, it was pretty smooth sailing though. At some point, we noticed there was a car driving right behind us. When we turned, the car turned after us. We automatically assumed it was one of our friends from school following us to hang out or something. None of us could tell who it was though. It was too dark to really make it out. We were all trying to guess, but honestly, I didn't really recognize the car at all. It was just a normal sedan, kind of small and blackish colored. It stayed behind us the whole time, and whenever we turned, it turned right after us. It continued to stay right on our tail until we arrived on my friend's street. I drove to her house and pulled over on the side of the road in front of it. The car pulled over right behind us. I was actually really surprised. The car had followed us all the way back. We were all still convinced it was one of our friends, though. High school kids will do whatever they want sometimes, for a laugh or whatever, really. After we parked, we started to get out of the car. I remember getting out and starting to walk over to the vehicle to see which of our friends was inside. Then the driver's door opened, and I saw a man start to emerge. This was no high school friend. This guy was at least 30, and I had never seen him before. Suddenly, I had a really bad feeling. 
I think the rest of my friends did too. Instead of doing something stupid like trying to run away on foot and get inside or something, all three of us jumped back in my car. The guy was still walking towards us, so I locked all the doors and rolled up all the windows. The man arrived at one of the back doors and tried to pull it open. As he did that, I slammed my foot on the gas and drove away. My friends told me the man was running back to his car. I drove about as fast as I could on that residential road. I went around a corner. There was a park with a path through it, so I slammed on my brakes and slowed down. I then turned onto the path and hid out of sight. It was not technically a street, and cars were obviously not supposed to go down this path, but it was wide enough that one could be hidden if they so wanted. I didn't know how I got this idea in the moment, but I just did it out of instinct. I drove down the path a little further, and the park was not very big, and obviously nobody was there. With it being late at night, I feared we might be discovered if the man thought the same, so I cut all the way through the path to the other side, where it connected to another street in a nearby neighborhood. I took a left, and we no longer could find any signs of the guy. Hopefully, he would have no idea where we were going at this point. I waited for a while, and then drove back to my house. After that, we hung out there for a few hours, until finally we went back to my friend's place. That made for the craziest high school football game experience I ever had. I hate going out. I'm thankful I'm married now. And my husband hates going out just as much as me. I never really enjoyed it at all. I know a lot of people, especially as they get older, slow down, and that's mainly because they get it out of their system when they're young. My friends started going out every weekend back in high school, and I was always the one kind of looking for ways to get out of it. One weekend during my senior year of high school, I was talked into going out to this house party at my friend Wanda's house. I tried every excuse in the book, but she was begging me to go. Eventually, I caved in. I remember being so anxious leading up to the party. Everyone from school was going, apparently. All week long, all I remember is people talking about this rager of a party going down at Wanda's. I got there early so I could find a nice corner of the house to post up in. It took a little while, but I finally started to unwind as the party went on. I was drinking a little bit, and I'm sure that was part of the equation of me loosening up. The party started around 7 that night, and by the time midnight rolled around, people were already starting to leave. I remember thinking to myself, you know, maybe going out isn't so bad every once in a while. I didn't want to drive home yet, though. At least, not right away. I had been drinking after all. I stayed with Wanda and helped her clean the place up a bit. She lived alone with just her dad and didn't want him to come home from his business trip to a destroyed house. There were five of us left at around one in the morning. The house was almost spotless by now. We'd really divided and conquered the different rooms with our cleaning. The other three girls were going to stay overnight. I was going to leave though, since I wasn't really feeling the alcohol anymore at this point. I went into the bathroom to wash my face and take care of business before the drive home. I wanted to make sure I was okay enough to drive my vehicle. While I was in the bathroom though, I heard a loud crash, followed by gasps and screams from my friends. I heard Wanda yelling something, something like, you can't be here anymore. That was instantly responded to by an aggressive woman's voice, screaming at everyone to shut up. I didn't know what to do. I could hear them crying and screaming and panicking coming from my friends. I felt like a coward, but I locked myself in the bathroom. I heard Wanda yell to my friends who were out in the room to get out of there. I heard loud bangs occurring, and I just sort of sat in the fetal position on the bathroom floor. I wished I could call someone for help. 
but I'd left my cell phone and my bag in the kitchen. I heard that aggressive voice again. You're not leaving. I could hear shoving, screaming. It was like witnessing a nightmare, but not being able to see what was actually happening. I couldn't imagine what my friends were going through on the other side of that door, and I just sat there in the bathroom like a coward. The crying and screaming continued. There were more loud bangs, the sound of glass shattering. It was enough for me to be paralyzed in fear. Many moments passed by before I heard Wanda say, Okay, go now! I heard a series of footsteps running by the door. I was too scared to act, though. I could hear the aggressive woman running by after, assumedly chasing my friends. She screamed at them to get back there. She began to do this unsettling, psychotic howling. It was the worst thing I'd ever heard in my entire life. I had no idea what was going on, and no way to get any information. Just when I thought the nightmare couldn't get any worse, the woman approached the bathroom door. She tried opening it, but realized someone was inside. She began pounding on the door, screaming and asking who was in the bathroom. I started crying and remained on the bathroom floor. The woman was relentlessly attacking the door. I was convinced it was going to break open at any second. This went on for agonizing minutes. I just hoped it would end soon. Then, I'm not even joking, the woman started to run back and forth outside the bathroom door. I don't know if she was on something or just some crazy, insane woman with the zoomies, but her footsteps were fast and heavy. It sounded like a bear stomping around outside the bathroom. I had no idea what was happening. Clearly, whoever this woman was thought this house belonged to her, and she knew Wanda by name. I was trying to put the pieces together in my mind. Due to the frantic nature of what was currently occurring outside my hiding space, though, I was a little bit distracted, to say the least. It wasn't long after my friends ran away that I heard a sound I found very comforting, the sound of the police entering the home. They apprehended the woman. I could hear her screaming and the sounds of a fight occurring on the other side. Eventually, one of the officers knocked on the bathroom door and asked if I was okay. It took me a second to answer, but I was finally able to make the words come out of my mouth. I unlocked the door and slowly came out to see what was on the other side. It was like seeing the nightmare come to reality. Their beautiful home had been destroyed. There was broken glass and objects everywhere. In the kitchen, I saw the woman handcuffed, standing with two officers. She looked over at me, and I'll never forget the look in her eyes. She had the most deranged eyes I'd ever seen. They were so big they were nearly bulging out of her sockets. She was breathing heavily, and when she noticed me leaving the bathroom, she started to scream at me that I was trespassing in her home. One of the officers started to escort me out of the house, and then I looked down at the lady's hands. They were all red, stained with what I assumed to be blood. I looked back and noticed the outside of the bathroom door was covered with bloody handprints all up and down, and blood was trickling onto the floor. This woman had destroyed her own body trying to get inside at me. It was traumatizing. When I got outside, I saw Wanda and all my friends. I'd never been so happy in my entire life. I remember being lost, locked in the bathroom, thinking that maybe they had abandoned me. In fact, they'd actually gone and got help to save me because they knew I was still inside. When I finally got my phone back, I had dozens of texts and missed calls from Wanda telling me to stay locked in the bathroom and not leave no matter what. She thought I had my phone on me, even though I did not. It turned out the crazy woman was Wanda's ex-stepmother. I guess if that's a thing. When she was married to her dad, she ended up going nuts and trying to kill her father, which was ultimately what led to them separating. She never quite accepted it clearly. We never found out what happened to her after that night. We realized quickly that Wanda didn't exactly want to talk about it, and we never pushed it either. Didn't seem like the right thing to do. Eventually, everyone sort of moved on. 
and my reasons as to why I don't like going out much, and this right here was one at the top of the list. I had one really scary experience during my time in college. It happened during my sophomore year. I attended a school that was somewhat small. You could walk across the entire campus in probably 20 minutes or less. I lived in one of the dorm buildings. I remember that that year was my toughest class schedule yet. Sometimes I would be stuck doing homework late into the night always in one of the buildings on campus. One night in particular, I was working on a lab assignment. It went pretty late, almost until midnight actually. When I was finally done, I packed up all my things and started to leave. The building was almost completely empty and most of the lights had been turned off as well. Campus was like a ghost town. I had to walk 10 minutes to get back to my dorm building. As I was going through a courtyard, a few minutes in, I noticed this guy. He was kind of skulking along the side of a building. I had to pass by this area. I'm not really even sure why. I looked over in that direction. I noticed this guy didn't look like a normal student or even an employee of the college. And the strangest thing, though, was that he appeared to be wearing what looked like some sort of mask. I could barely see him at all, but from what I did see, he was wearing a black mask over his face. I just kind of thought it was strange. I kept walking to my destination. About two minutes later though, I got this sudden bad feeling and looked behind me. I saw the man walking. He was a really long ways back, but he was clearly walking the same way as me. I started to get worried. He hadn't been walking in that direction before. He was just kind of aimlessly wandering about. I hoped that he wasn't following me or something. As I got closer to my dorm building, I looked behind me again. The man was still there following me. I couldn't hear him walking because he was being so quiet, but I could sense his presence there. I tried to walk a little bit faster. I still felt like I could make it to my dorm just fine. The guy was a fair distance away still. I just had a little bit further to go. For the next couple minutes, I did not look behind me. I didn't hear the guy either. When my dorm building was in sight, I glanced over my shoulder. Now, I could not only still see the man, but he was much closer to me, maybe about 20 feet behind me. Perhaps a little more. I started to get really nervous when I saw that. This guy was definitely following me. Still, I knew I could make it to my dorm before he did. At last, I arrived at my building. I rushed in the front door and used my key fob to get through the second set of doors. I made sure that the doors closed right behind me. The man wasn't inside yet. I felt like I had escaped from a bad situation. After walking through the empty lobby into the first hallway, I saw a student seemingly leaving. As I passed by them in the hallway, they walked past me. I was not sure where they were going. I continued to the end of the hallway where the stairs were. We didn't have an elevator in my dorm, and my room was all the way on the fourth floor. I had this crazy thought as I was walking down the hallway. What if that student was leaving the building and accidentally let that guy inside? Probably five seconds after I had that thought, I heard the door opening in the distance. I was a good ways down the hall, but I had not reached the stairs yet. Moments later, I heard somebody enter the hallway from the lobby. I looked over. The masked man was moving in my direction, heading very fast. I quickly ran into the stairwell and up the stairs as fast as I possibly could. About the time I reached the fourth floor, I heard the guy in the stairwell. I sprinted down the hallway into my room. As I was entering, the man reached the top of the stairs. He didn't come to my room or anything, though. I kept watching out the people, waiting to see if he would. I decided to call the police and let them know what happened. They came out and searched the whole dorm building and found the man hiding in the basement. 
He was not a student at all. I'm not sure what he was doing on campus. The student that left the dorm after I'd entered had in fact let the guy in. Apparently, the guy had removed his ski mask while I wasn't looking and told the student he was looking at the university for his kid. He must have put it back on after arriving inside. The person leaving must not have thought much of it. It made me scared to go out at night on campus for a while. Luckily, nothing like that happened again. A few years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to drive across country. Not for any special reason, really. More for the thrill of the adventure. We had done beach trips, cruises, skydiving, you name it. The one thing we never did was drive all the way across country. I can't remember exactly what state we were in, but it was somewhere in the Midwest, I believe. We found this cute little diner and decided to grab some food. That was the one thing we wanted to do at each place we stopped at. Find a diner and eat there. We were sitting in a small booth in the back of the restaurant, and a middle-aged woman approached me. She was short and had an average build. Her hair was red and somewhat curly. What I remember most about her physical appearance was she had very vibrant green eyes. I had never seen such green eyes before. They were objectively very pretty. She kind of pulled a curved ball on me when she looked right in my eyes and told me I had the most beautiful eyes she had ever seen. I just smiled and laughed a little. I thanked her and went back to drinking my coffee. This woman then sat down next to my girlfriend and continued to tell me how beautiful my eyes were. At first it was nice, but now it started creeping into unsettling territory. I could tell my girlfriend was not having any of this at all. She went into a full 10 minute rant, raving about how beautiful my eyes were and how she wished she could have them, before she finally got up and went back to her table where she had been sitting alone. I started to bust my girlfriend's chops. She seemed a little jealous, which I found funny because she's not usually the jealous type at all. I did notice that the woman was continuously staring at me, but I pretended I hadn't seen anything. I didn't want to worry my girlfriend or make her feel bad. I'm not going to lie, this was starting to feel a little bit obsessive. I was about ready to hit the road, and so was my girlfriend. We left and headed out. Every few hours, I would ask my girlfriend what she thought about my eyes just to tease her. She wasn't as amused as I was, unfortunately. While we were driving, she kept telling me she had a really bad feeling about that woman. She claimed that something was not quite right with her. It was like she was dangerous, or at least had the capabilities to be dangerous. I didn't necessarily feel that, even though she had been a little bit wacky. Eventually, we simply stopped talking about her and continued on our trip. No more talk about eyes at all. During the night sometime, we decided to pull over at some sort of desolate mountain road. I pointed at the sky, and we couldn't believe our eyes. The view of the stars looked like we were standing right there in space. It was beautiful. I took the truck off-road a little bit and decided to open the back so we could lay there for a while and stare at the night sky together. It was lovely, and for a moment it was one of the best moments of my entire life. That was until it became one of the most scary and startling moments I'd ever experienced. About 20 minutes after climbing into the back of the truck, we started to hear something weird. I was sure it was a coyote or some other type of animal that dwelt in the area, but it soon became clear that this noise was a voice, not an animal. I grabbed my softball bat which was in the back of the truck and jumped out from the back. Standing right there on the side of my truck was the woman from the diner. She was just looking at me with her hands hidden behind her back. She wasn't smiling or frowning. She had a blank expression. She was clearly mumbling something, but I couldn't make out exactly what she was saying. I told my girlfriend to get in the front seat and grab my keys. 
which she quickly did. The woman refused to break eye contact with me. I slowly backed up to the driver's side door, and once I was next to it, I basically jumped inside the truck. I slammed the keys in the ignition and sped away. I didn't get very far, though. The woman dove out in front of my truck, and I had to slam on the brakes to not run her over. I could hear the woman crying and screaming on the outside. I was ignoring it to the best of my ability. After that dive, I tried to swerve around her and sped off, leaving a huge cloud of dust in my retreat. Maybe a mile or so down the road, I saw a car parked off the side. We both knew it had to be hers. The pit in our stomachs grew even bigger. We must have made enough distance between us and her, though, because thankfully we never saw her again. While we were driving away, we started to reflect on that moment and realized just how scary and horrifying that could have been. We'd driven for hours after we left that diner, and the woman had followed us the entire way without us ever noticing. She even crossed state lines to do so. What she intended to do to us is unknown, and I'm happy it's going to stay that way. If we didn't notice her creeping up the side of our truck when we did, who knows what she would have done to us. Enough time has passed now that when we tell this story, my friends like to joke that this woman was the monster from Jeepers Creepers because she said she wanted my eyes. It's a ridiculous little chapter of my life, and one I'm happy to have escaped from with no real harm done. What do you do when teenagers terrorize you? I mean that sincerely. Like, what are the rules and laws? Well, I'm going to tell you a story so you understand what I mean. I stopped at a rest stop while driving to a town about three hours from where I live. My job has me visit places all over the region, and I usually have to be there at 6 or 6.30 in the morning. Whenever I have to go pretty far, I usually just leave in the middle of the night. One night specifically, I wasn't feeling very well. It was a little over halfway through my drive there. I felt like I really needed to stop at a rest stop and go to the bathroom, wash my face and maybe try to recalibrate myself a little. I was just feeling really horrible. I was in the bathroom for maybe 15 minutes. I don't need to go into any more details there, but when I came out of the bathroom and started walking to my car, I was confronted by four random teenagers. Clearly, they were all under the age of 18. One of them said something I couldn't understand. All of a sudden, one of the other ones slammed me on the back of the head. And before I knew it, all four of them were beating me while I was laying in the fetal position on the ground. It didn't help that I already felt like I was going to throw up, but I also couldn't defend myself because they were clearly kids. They grabbed my phone and wallet from my pocket. I was able to push one of them off of me while they were doing this. I received a brutal kick to my head in retaliation. I got up and sprinted to my car, and for once I was happy my lock button didn't always work. My car was still unlocked. I was able to jump in, and I manually locked the doors. These kids surrounded my car in the front and back, and I felt trapped. It's easy to say what you would have done in the situation, but I promise you, if you were in my shoes, you would have been scared and confused as well. Whenever I tell this story to people, they often say some nonsense, like, oh, well, you should have just run them all over. Yeah, I'm gonna kill a bunch of teenagers. Honestly, looking back, maybe I should have just done that. But in the moment, I was too scared. I didn't know what to do. I was trapped in this situation. The kids began attacking my car, trying to break my windows. I could really only clearly see the one teenager in front of my car. He was smashing my hood with both of his fists and some large blunt object in the other hand. I think it was a pipe or something. He had green hair and was really skinny. They were all skinny. I do remember that. It was his face I remember the most. You know when you can just tell someone is young? His face looked so young. 
A few of these teenagers were yelling at me. They still had high-pitched voices, even. I could hear them. I knew it was only a matter of time before they would get in if they kept attacking my car the way they were. I hate to say this, but I was already accepting my defeat. Then, something happened that pretty much saved my life. A car pulled in to the rest area and caught the attention of the two teens that were standing behind my vehicle. They stepped away and moved toward the other car for a moment. The vehicle that pulled in saw what was happening, and they sped off immediately. They must have gotten scared. Either they saw my car being attacked, or they saw four people eyeing them up and thought to themselves, that's not happening. That brief distraction was all I needed, though. I slapped the car into reverse and slammed the gas. I spun the car around, put it in drive, and sped off just like the other car. I could see these 14-year-olds trying to pursue me on foot in my mirrors. Once I got back on the highway, I was long gone. That was the longest drive of my entire life. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't call for help because they'd stolen my phone. I didn't stop. I ended up driving all the way to work. Once I got inside, I was able to call the police and told them what happened. More importantly, where it happened. I hoped that maybe they would send a patrol car to the rest area in case these monsters came back and tried to attack someone else in the middle of the night again. Granted, I wasn't in the right state of mind at the time. I didn't see anyone at all there when pulling into the parking lot that night and there were no other cars there, so those kids must have been in hiding somewhere nearby, literally just waiting to jump someone. It's sad those kids were willing to do this much at such a young age. I never got my phone or my wallet back. I cancelled all my cards and had to replace my ID and phone immediately. A small price to pay for still having my life, I suppose. I did end up calling the police in that town about a month later to get an update, but they didn't find anyone at the rest stop, and no one else ever reported being jumped by a bunch of kids in that area. They did tell me that they'd arrested a 16-year-old boy for robbery, who matched a description of one of them I described, but because he was a minor, he got released with no punishment. That was pretty much all the information he could give me. They did locate my phone in a trash can, about 10 miles from the rest area. The screen had been smashed, but the phone seemed to work still. So, yeah, that's my nightmare story about being attacked by four kids. I'd love to know what you would have done in that situation. Would you fight back against them and hurt them, or would you just accept defeat like I did? When I was 12 or 13, I remember I was at a Halloween party. We had returned from trick-or-treating and were playing games back at the house. That was when we heard a knock on the front room window. We all turned to look but couldn't see who it was. There were blinds hanging there, so we pulled them out of the way to see what was going on. We saw a man standing outside, now a few feet away from the window. He was wearing hospital robes. We all thought it was a great costume, although it could have done with some makeup to make it even more terrifying. We waved to the man and closed the blinds once more. The next thing we knew, though, a huge rock came flying through the window. Luckily, it didn't hit anybody directly, but it could have caused some serious damage if it did. Everyone began to panic. We could hear him screaming and shouting outside as he continued to throw rocks through our window. My mom called the police, and my dad went outside to confront the man. Thankfully, the police arrived very promptly, along with an ambulance as well. Everyone was confused they'd arrived so fast until the police explained what was going on. The man was in fact an actual patient suffering from a mental disorder who had escaped from the hospital. He was going to be moved somewhere more permanent and escaped while they were doing it. I remember being really shaken up by this. I mean, that guy could have really hurt one of us with his rocks, and on Halloween of all nights too.
When I went to college during my senior year, I lived in a house with one roommate. The house was a little ways off campus, and my roommate's name was Alyssa. A few months into the school year, Alyssa went back home one weekend. That meant I would have the house all to myself. The house wasn't that big, and I didn't really think too much of this. The very first night, though, something happened while I was all by myself. I was in my bedroom, and it was probably around 11 at night or so. I was just watching a movie or something, when all of a sudden I heard a loud banging at the front door. It wasn't even like somebody knocking. It was like they were slamming as hard as they possibly could. I was immediately startled by this, obviously. I got up and left my bedroom to go see who this was that was banging so hard. It went on for about 15 seconds straight, I would say. As I was walking down the hallway that led to the living room at the front of the home, it stopped altogether. I arrived at the front door and looked out the window. When I did, I saw two men at once. One of them was running to the left, and the other one was taking off to the right. I only saw them for a split second before they ran out of my view. It all happened so fast. I had no clue what these guys were doing out there, but I did know they were running through my yard and heading to either side of the house, or perhaps even the back. I moved away to go to the back of the house. The kitchen was there and the dining room. I walked into the dining room and pulled back the curtains to the window. I looked out, and right away I saw a guy right there. He swung what appeared to be a bat at me right through the window. Thankfully, the window did not break on the first hit, but it was very loud, and I heard a cracking sound. I instantly ran away and went to my bedroom. When I got there, I grabbed my phone and called 911. I also locked my bedroom door. As I was doing this, I heard several more bangs from the window, and eventually the glass broke altogether. I was terrified. All I could do was hope they wouldn't try to enter my room. Whoever they were, I heard the two men enter the house and walk into the living room area. I was on the phone with 911, begging for them to get there faster. The footsteps of the men inside were loud and clear as they went around the living room for maybe a minute or two. It sounded like they went back to the rear of the house after. Then I stopped hearing them at all. It was like they had suddenly just left for some reason. Things were silent for a while after that. I couldn't believe it. I would say maybe three or four minutes later the police arrived. I carefully left my room and let them in the front door. They searched the house and the entire property, but the men were long gone. The window had been broken in, and the house had been messed up as well. Nothing appeared to be stolen at all, strangely enough. The police eventually left, and I had to get a new window. I still wonder what those guys were doing sometimes. I think they broke into the wrong house or something. The way they broke in and left so fast just didn't sit right with me. A few years ago when I was in college, I did quite a lot of studying. I took school very seriously and needed to spend extra time on certain subjects. Sometimes I would go to study halls and work on assignments well into the night. I could just focus a lot better there. I think a lot of students had similar feelings to me because I would often see many other people working on things very late. Now, I went to a pretty large university. The campus was quite big and there were many different buildings. One Friday night, I went to one of the study halls that I had classes in to get work done. With it being a weekend, there were not quite as many people around campus at night. While I was in the building, I didn't see anyone else at all, in fact. I found an empty classroom and went inside by myself. I sat down at a table and took out my laptop and my notes. I began working. This went on for several hours. I would often lose track of time when I was working particularly hard. I remember at one point, 
I heard a door open and shut, off in the distance somewhere. When I heard that, I just kind of figured someone else was in the building now, and didn't really give it too much thought. But as I kept on working, I soon heard footsteps approaching my classroom. I could see the front door to the classroom from where I was. It had a small window on it to see outside. I looked over and saw somebody appear at the window. It was some guy I didn't recognize at all. He looked in and then slipped away out of sight. I figured he was just looking for a classroom that was empty like I was, to study or work in. I went back to what I was doing. After that, about a minute or two later though, I suddenly heard the classroom door open up. I looked up and saw that same guy was back. I watched him enter the room but didn't pay attention to him for much longer. I looked back down at my laptop. I was actually kind of annoyed this guy was coming in here. Most of the classrooms in this building were about the same. He could have gone to any other empty one, but instead he was going to the one I was trying to focus on my work in. For the next minute or so, I just tried to ignore his presence, but that's when I realized that I'd never heard this guy sit down. I glanced up and saw he was still just standing there, just inside the doorway. He was kind of looking ahead with a thousand-yard stare, not directly at me. He glanced over at me, but I couldn't really tell what he was doing. It was really creeping me out. He was just standing there, not saying anything at all. I decided I would just leave. I packed up my laptop and my notes, then got up. The guy was still standing there. I actually began to get a little bit concerned. I asked the man if he was okay, but he didn't answer me or move at all. I walked a bit closer to him and once again asked him if everything was alright. He suddenly moved. He began to back away from me and gave me a very strange look. He still didn't say anything. I just left the classroom. I didn't know what to make of his weird behavior, but something was clearly off here. Not long after leaving that classroom, I was walking down the hallway. That's when I heard the door to the classroom open once more. I saw the guy leaving and starting to follow after me. I walked a bit faster and he followed me all the way to the entrance of the building. I left and ran out to my car in the parking lot. I saw the guy try to follow me there as well, but I got to my car and drove away. Luckily, I didn't see him get into a car to follow me any further. After that experience, I didn't study in that building late at night ever again. At the beginning of this past summer, I had an experience that was just about as far opposite of a good night as you can possibly imagine. Four of my friends and I met at my apartment after work that night. We all got ready at my place, since I have two bathrooms in the apartment. I had a new dress and was feeling pretty confident. I was also able to wear these cute blue heels I had bought at a thrift store two years ago that I'd never found a good outfit to match with. We spent a good hour getting ready and were about to leave and head to this big party that was happening. My friend Megan's boyfriend was throwing a big bash at this barn. I know that sounds like a setup for a bad horror movie or something, but we'd actually done this before many times now. His name is Charlie, and when he threw a party, he really went all out. Got a DJ, a dance floor, and even let people crash at his house after. And the only thing that really sucked was the drive there. It was about 45 minutes from my apartment. We wouldn't get there until a little after 10.30 or so. And the barn is exactly where you'd think it was. Smack dab in the middle of nowhere. And that's what made his party so great, though. You could be as loud as you wanted, you weren't disturbing anyone or causing any problems. Why am I writing this then, you might ask? Why was this night out so particularly bad? Well, in short, because we never made it to the party. Megan and one of my friends drove separately. I drove with my friend Ashley so we could stop and grab some beer first, then drive out there. 
Megan was getting antsy from being so late, and that's why we said we'd just meet them there. We grabbed our beer and started to drive to the party. About halfway through the drive, you get off the highway, and the rest of the trip is just long, desolate roads. It's really creepy at night, to be honest. It's just pure darkness for 30 minutes until you reach Charlie's place. While we were driving on those dark roads, we nearly went off-road at one point. Out of nowhere, this random person had just run out of the darkness into the middle of the road, waving this bright flashlight into our car. We both screamed at the randomness of the situation and pulled over to the side of the road. That was mistake number one. Ashley said she needed to catch her breath for a moment. I was pushing her to hurry up because I could see this person with the flashlight was now rapidly approaching the car. Ashley didn't seem to care about that person though. She was still trying to get her composure from almost driving us off the road. Just as she was getting ready to drive away, the figure approached the vehicle on her side. He was strangely close to the car, but I didn't think too much about it at first. She cracked her window and started to talk to this young man. That was the second mistake. The man told us he was coming from the party we were going to and that he had lost his phone somewhere. While he was driving there, he'd gotten a flat tire and his car flew off the road. Ashley was trying to be sympathetic, even though I just kept telling her to drive away. In a calm and reassuring voice, this random guy said, Listen, I know I'm a stranger on the side of the road and all, but I'm not asking for a ride or anything. I just want to know if I can use your phone. I can call for a ride? I mean, I just came from the party I assume you guys are heading to and we're all friends here. I didn't like how this felt. Something about this just felt off. Ashley had a real weakness, though. She was just too nice. Instead of just asking him the number, she literally handed him the phone through the crack in the window. He took a few steps from the car and it appeared like he really was trying to make a call. I was freaking out a bit, but she just kept telling me it'd be okay. A few moments later, he came back over and dropped the phone back into the window crack. He thanked Ashley for her kindness, and I started to think that maybe this guy was not so bad after all. He then asked if we could help him get his bag out of his car. Ashley seemed confused. She asked him why we would need to do that. He said to us that his car had gone off the road like he said before and was now tangled in some thick brush. To get his bag out, one of us would have to hold his arm to make sure he didn't fall and get hurt. That didn't make much sense to me. This guy hadn't given us a reason not to trust him by that point though. Ashley thought about it for a moment and then unlocked her car door. I grabbed her arm and whispered to her, What are you doing? She just shushed me and opened the door. The man kept saying thank you every two seconds. Obviously, I couldn't let Ashley go alone into the night, so I got out of the car as well. There we were now, two girls in heels and dresses, helping some random guy in the middle of nowhere. I thought to myself, this is literally how every stupid character dies in horror movies. We got to the side of the road, and the man said it was just down there. We both looked at each other. Aren't you going to shine the light in that direction? He didn't say anything. We turned around. He began looking around frantically like he was waiting for something. I smacked Ashley on the arm and motioned my head to our car. We needed to leave right now. I think Ashley finally agreed with me. Without saying anything, we turned around and ran back to our car. The man chased after us. Hey, wait! I'm sorry, I didn't mean to freak you out. Please, I need your help! As we were getting into the car, we noticed the tires on the driver's side were completely flat now. We hadn't run anything over, so we had no idea what could have happened. She tried to drive, but it was rims on the road. We didn't get very far. I called our friend Megan, and Ashley called the police. Megan didn't answer. I texted her and told her what was happening and to send help right away. Ashley told the police what was going on, and they said they would get someone as soon as possible to come out there. 
Not two minutes later, Mr. Bright Lights appeared from off the road, and a big truck parked right in front of us. Now, the man with the light was standing right outside Ashley's window. He began banging on the glass. We knew we'd never make it out of this. Until the cops arrived, we would be sitting ducks. The next ten minutes were the worst of my entire life. The man with the light was banging on the windows, showing us his knife. He had this horrible smile on his face. It became quite clear to us that this man had most likely slashed the tires of Ashley's car when we left to assist him. There was also another person in that big truck we still hadn't seen yet. Then, two trucks sped down the street. The man with the light jumped into the truck blocking our path, and they sped away in the opposite direction. It turned out the two trucks were Charlie and a bunch of our friends. Megan had got our text and told everyone in the party we were in trouble. They came right away to try and save us. Unfortunately, in the heat of the moment, nobody thought to get the details on the big truck. Everyone just wanted to make sure we were alright. It was nearly ten minutes after that when the police finally showed up. It was only one squad car, too. We told them everything and they seemed very dismissive. They were more concerned with the alcohol in our car, even though we hadn't had one sip yet. It makes me so mad. This man is likely still out there, causing more harm. Who knows what happened to his accomplice, either. I hate to say it, but sometimes being kind can get you seriously into bad situations. We were lucky to get out of there unharmed, but not everyone is so lucky as we were. When I was in high school, I was really into sports. I played on the football, basketball, and baseball teams. This took place during my senior year and after a basketball game one night. I loved weightlifting and would work out in the school weight room all the time. I remember we had a basketball game at 7 o'clock that night, which ended at about 9 p.m., after the game, my coach would always stick around for a while in his office. On this night, we went back to the locker room, and the coach talked to us like always. I remember that we had won the game, and after the coach was done, the guys all started changing and leaving. I told coach that I was going to go lift some weights. He said that was fine and to be careful, so I left the locker room and went over to the weights room. It was kind of on the other side of the school, in another wing. The weight room was also kind of tucked away. You had to walk past a bunch of janitor's closets to get there. I went inside and started lifting. It was kind of nice, actually. It was just me all by myself in there. I was really focused on getting in as good a shape as I could at that point, because I was going to be playing football in college next year. I worked out in there for probably 40 minutes or so. I was going to go back to the locker room and take a shower, then drive home. By now, everybody else in the school was gone except for my coach. The night janitors might have also been there, I believe. There were two overnight janitors, and I knew both of them because of my many late nights at the school. After exiting the weights room, I passed by one of the janitor's closets. I'm not sure why, but I felt the need to peek in as I was passing by. I saw what appeared to be a man hiding inside, sort of crouched down behind some stuff. After passing that strange scene, I stopped where I was and began to think to myself, Wait a second, did I really just see that? I almost went back to look and double check, but I realized that whoever this guy was, he must have known I had seen him. I just decided to keep walking instead. I was going to find one of the night janitors and let them know about that suspicious guy hiding in their closets. The locker room was still a ways away, which was also where the coach's office was. Before I was even out of the first hallway, though, I heard footsteps echoing behind me. I just knew it was that guy I had seen, but I had no clue as to who he could be. The school was completely silent by this time, so I could easily hear the man following me. 
I reached the end of the hallway and took a right. As I was continuing down that hallway, I continued to hear the man right behind me. I couldn't seem to find the night janitors anywhere, and whoever was following me was clearly gaining on me. At that point, I decided to just leave. I walked down another hallway to the closest exit I knew. When I got there, I left the school. As I left the building, the man behind me did not make an attempt to follow me out. I had to walk all the way around the school to the side door, but that was also locked. Luckily, I had my phone. I called my coach and told him what was going on. He came to the side doors and let me in. I was able to get back to the locker room, change, and grab all my stuff. My coach told me he would go see who the guy was. He also said I should just go home now and leave the rest to him. I left after that. I never heard what ended up happening with the guy. Maybe he left the school as well. I'm not entirely sure. What was he doing in there? Why was he hiding in the janitor's closet? I'm not sure what reason he could have possibly had, nor why he chose to follow me. The story I'm about to share with you all started when I was a freshman in high school. I had gotten to know a lot of kids, and I met this one kid named TJ. He happened to be on the baseball and football team with me. Keep in mind I had only known him for a few months. One day, sometime during the first few months of my freshman year, I decided to go over to TJ's house. I went over with my other friend, who I had known since I was very young. We'll call him Finn. Key details to this story. I had been to TJ's house a few times before and slept over several times as well. His parents knew me, and my parents knew TJ's parents. When I got to TJ's house, we waited for Finn to get dropped off. When he did, we all decided to go to a nearby school. Some of TJ's other friends were supposedly goofing off on the roof of the school. When we arrived and saw his friends weren't there though, we decided to walk to the other side of the neighborhood TJ lived in. To get to the other side of the neighborhood, we had to cut through a community college. It was quite a small campus, really. At this point, I didn't really know where we were going. I asked TJ, but he didn't give me a response. My phone was about to die, and I told TJ this. He said I could charge it later. As we were halfway through the community college, we surprisingly ran into five friends of TJ's. Three of them I had met briefly once before. They were the type of people where bad stuff just follows them like a cloud. The other two friends of TJ's were kids I'd never seen before or met. I asked TJ where we were going again, and he said to one of his friend's houses. I started to get a weird feeling. My phone had died by this point, and it was pretty dark out by now. I was just walking. Suddenly, one of TJ's friends started talking about how I was bad talking his mom. I hadn't said a single word at all though. TJ then insisted that I did. Shortly after this, he insisted that he and his other friends fight me. Mind you, Finn, my good friend, did not say anything and stood there not really knowing what to do. I'd been in a couple of fights before and could sort of hold my ground. One of TJ's friends at this point began circling me. He got in my face and shoved me. I turned, but his friend threw a punch at me from behind. It missed. I felt someone else punch me in my back though. I turned and tossed one of the guys to the ground. I tried to pin him down, but another guy kicked me. The guy I had pinned down switched on top of me and started to punch me. He punched me so hard one of my contacts flew out. I couldn't see now. I got up and was bleeding from the eye. TJ and two of his friends insisted we continue to fight and started placing bets on who would win. I just tried to walk away. As I was, TJ took a photo of me. Somebody else, I guess, had taken a video of the fight as well. It got passed around to everyone on the baseball team. 
everybody was angry at TJ for not helping me. Anyways, we eventually walked back to TJ's house. Finn's mom was waiting to pick him up. The parents found out I was in a fight, but were more worried about TJ than me. I was bleeding, and my parents found out as well. They were quite mad, as you can imagine. We filed a police report. TJ's friends had basically assaulted and attacked me for no reason. Days later, TJ was taken to a mental hospital. Apparently, he said he wanted to come to school and shoot me in the back of the head. He wanted to do it in class right in front of everyone, too. I took him to court for a restraining order, but the judge did not grant it. He told us to make up and be friends again. I realized I had been lured into the dark area of that community college on purpose, most likely to harm me. Finn did not help me, and I haven't talked to him ever since. I blocked TJ on everything, and I haven't seen him since either. I hope TJ doesn't do this to anyone else again, but it's a lesson that you might not know your friends as well as you think you do. A few weeks ago, I became unexpectedly involved in an automobile incident. You see, a section of my commute during the week passes by the business district of my city. Generously peppered amongst the area are a large number of small bars and restaurants. Every evening of the week at around 5 p.m., lawyers and executives flood these places to just kind of chill out. With all the alcohol being consumed, more than a couple of accidents have occurred. Especially in one particular intersection. In order to leave the city and get to the surrounding suburbs where most of these people live, you have to pass through this exact intersection. I'm not exaggerating when I say I spend almost a day's worth of time every month stuck in traffic waiting for a wreck to be cleared away. It's a very dangerous area. Several members of the community have even begged the mayor and city council to do something about it. Nothing ever gets done, of course. Around the middle of last month, I was on my way home. I approached that area just in time to actually witness a crash taking place. I was at the top of the hill and headed toward the intersection when a car T-boned another. It was a very shocking thing to witness. When I reached the bottom of the hill, I pulled off into a nearby parking lot in hopes of providing the victims with some assistance. I reached the car of the man who'd caused the wreck before anyone else. He seemed extremely disoriented. I couldn't see any injuries on him. I opened the door and asked if he was okay. I was overcome by the smell of alcohol. My heart sank immediately. He was clearly intoxicated and unable to know how severe his injuries may have been. Maybe a moment later, another gentleman arrived and asked me if the driver was injured. I took the man aside a few steps away and whispered to him that the man was drunk. The gentleman was clearly angered and began cursing the driver under his breath. While I'd been speaking to this gentleman, we hadn't noticed the driver had emerged from his car and begun pacing around. A couple of other bystanders arrived and pointed this out. We all turned back toward him and urged him to return to his vehicle. During the scuffle, one of the bystanders must have caught a whiff of the driver. He yelled out, This guy's drunk! When the driver heard this, he became even more irritated. Just then, the driver of the other vehicle walked up and asked about the drunk driver's condition. Without any hesitation, the same man repeated what he'd said to the other driver. His expression changed from one of concern to outright rage. He began screaming about how his son was injured because of this drunk idiot. Suddenly, the driver crashed through all of us and pounced on the drunk man. He began hitting him over and over, kicking him in the face while he was on the ground. We managed to pull him off. One of the other bystanders, a big guy, walked with the driver back to his car. We tried to get the drunk man back into his vehicle. Less than 30 seconds later, the cops began to arrive and check everybody out. An officer approached the drunk driver's car with an EMT. 
The officer walked up to us soon after. They asked why the man had been beaten up. We all just looked at one another, unsure of what to say. One guy spoke up and said the man had tried to walk away from the crash and fought us, and we attempted to stop him. Nobody else dared to speak. The cops stared at us with a skeptical look for a few seconds, before saying okay and walking away. After that, everyone sort of just milled around. I did discover the other driver's son had been injured in the wreck. It had been his side of the car that had been struck by the other. The airbag smashed his glasses into his face. I believe he'd also broken his arm. I can definitely understand why the father was so mad. That evening, I had a lot of time to think about what happened. I don't regret what we did, considering the man chose to drink and drive, only to go on and hurt a child. I have a difficult time feeling bad for him getting attacked. Don't get me wrong, I don't agree with taking the law into your own hands, but being a father myself, I can understand the anger. I wish I could tell you what happened after, but there's not been any news about it. Unfortunately, it's a very common thing in the area these days. Honestly, the news around here doesn't even find it important to report on anymore. The roads can really be a dangerous place, so I hope everyone stays safe and keeps your eyes open. Don't end up in that sort of situation, or God forbid, something even worse. So back in my 20s, I rode around with a group of guys from work. I was a mechanic at a Honda dealership then, and on most weekends, we'd ride together. You know, join up with some friends, go on long rides across the state. I was single at the time, and had no family waiting for me back home. I was especially partial to hammock and tent camping, so I'd go along on the lake and hunting trips. None of us at the dealership were what people would consider outlaw bikers or anything, but that didn't mean we didn't sometimes find ourselves riding or partying with a few of those. As a matter of fact, I'll be sharing an incident that I was part of a little over 10 years back. I'm only telling it now because I know one of the guys involved have since died and I'm fairly confident the statute of limitations has passed on it. No matter what the legal circumstances are though, I won't be saying any real names. I'm not here to snitch anyone out. I just know a good story when I see it, and it'd be a downright shame not to share it with others. It was late summer of 2012. The boys and I were riding with six other dudes that we knew. These guys could definitely be classed as outlaws. I know they all had a record, and at least one had done time for assault. These weren't the kind of guys you'd want to make angry. The group of us had been hopping from state park to state park, camping out and having a good time. When this story happened, we were all making a run for the store to grab some beer and food. Everyone was riding in sets of two, except for one guy riding up front, and a guy following the pack of us in his truck. It was a one-way, two-lane section of road. No one was really in any hurry. We were all just enjoying the beautiful day. I think we were about two miles from town. When some hot shot in a Mustang came blazing up behind us, shooting through traffic, he weaved up to us. We got out of his way. It was an irksome situation, but we had places to go. Nobody wanted to get into any trouble. Well, except for Mr. Hot Rod there. He blew past at a blazing speed, and we returned to our previous riding positions. This guy went another 20 yards until he slowed down. The man came up behind one of our guys riding in the left lane, and another random woman driving a car. He started to get antsy, I guess. He began swerving through both lanes back and forth. Our guy in the front slowed down to let this idiot pass us by. Instead of waiting for enough room to form to weave through, this guy gunned his car and just barely squeezed between our guy's bike and the back of this lady's car. Our guy assumed he was going to get smacked and took a plunge into the grassy median. At this point, all niceties went out the window. The guy must have seen what he'd caused because he sped off at about 100 miles an hour. 
We weren't going to just let this idiot get away, though. While the rest of the guys stayed back with our friend, me and two others chased after him. I don't know if he thought he'd escaped or what, but he slowed down as he approached town. We got up to him at a red light. He was trapped behind another car. At this point, he had no escape. I'll admit I had no clue what was going to happen if we caught the guy. I was just so angry he tried to kill one of our friends. I wanted some form of revenge. I suppose I should have expected what happened. The two guys I was with weren't exactly angels. Either way, I was in the back. I watched as one guy rode up to the passenger side and smashed his window out with a hammer. The other guy did the same, before grabbing the man and pulling him onto the ground. While they roughed him up, I grabbed a big crescent wrench from my saddlebag and smashed any bits of glass or plastic on the back of the car I could find. I figured the cops may be on their way at this point. I ran up front to grab the others. What I saw was horrible. They had beat the man within an inch of his life. He was left a whining and bloody mess. They'd clearly done this business before. The guy didn't die or anything, but I imagine he learned to be a much more considerate driver. After that, we hopped back on our bikes and raced back to where the accident happened. Fortunately, our friend was still okay. His bike had been completely destroyed, but somehow he'd managed to make it out fine. The other guys had already gotten him into the truck and were ready to go when we arrived. That would be the end of that trip. We got back home as fast as we could, and we didn't take that highway again for quite some time. I wouldn't see much of those guys after that trip. Several of them ended up in prison for various reasons. One of those guys who'd beat that prick up died in a crash in 2018. I've moved on to other things since then. I've got a family now and live a pretty relatively respectable life. Back in those days, I caused my fair share of trouble and fought plenty of people. All that said, I've never seen someone as bad off as I did that day. Be careful out there, folks, and be respectful of the other drivers you share the road with especially motorcyclists. They tend to be a different breed of people, and they don't live by halves. This is a crazy experience I had several years ago now. I should mention that I'm a woman. I was at a park one day. This was a city park that I was walking through. On the way back home from work, it's a pretty large area within a large city, so there's usually quite a lot of people there. As I walked through at some point, though, I noticed a guy very conspicuously following me. I remember I noticed him when I stopped for a moment to look at something, and saw him stop as well and just kind of stand around. As I was walking away, he started immediately walking behind me. Soon, I left the park area, and went on to a city sidewalk. As I was waiting to cross the street, I could see him standing there around me. Each time I looked at the guy to see where he was, it appeared he was looking right at me as well. At this point though, I didn't know for certain if he was following me or not. All I had were suspicions. I had to walk another 10 minutes to get back to my apartment. I checked behind me every so often, and each time I did that, the man was still there, still following me. This was the first time that something like this had ever happened to me. At last, when I reached my building, he was about 20 feet behind me. I quickly went inside and used my key to enter the building. I then closed the door behind me, and the guy did not enter. I'm not sure if he tried to or if he simply kept walking past when I went in. I remembered what he looked like, but I figured I would never have to see him again. Several hours later that night, though, I got a notification on my phone. A new Instagram follower. When I opened this app, I saw who the follower was. I looked at the profile picture and saw it was the same man who had been following me earlier. I had no idea how he knew my name or even found my profile. Obviously, after seeing this, I blocked him immediately. I was really creeped out. How did he get my information? 
The very next night when I was home in my apartment, I got another Instagram notification. This same guy had followed my second profile. It wasn't even connected to the first one. I had a second account where I posted more random things. It was only given to my closest friends, and the account was private as well. He was requesting to follow me. The account was so private that I didn't even use my real name. I didn't even follow it but my main account. It was not connected in any way. I was more freaked out than anything now. I blocked him on that profile as well. Only about 30 minutes after this, there was a knock at my door. I walked over and looked through the peephole. The same guy was standing outside my door. Now, I knew he knew where I lived. I didn't know how he'd gotten which unit was mine, though. I sure as hell was not going to open the door. He knocked again after about a minute or so. I kept watching him, but he refused to leave. He just kept standing there. I called the police and kept an eye on this man. He was just standing there as if he fully expected me to open the door for him. Occasionally, he would pace around a little, but he kept returning to right in front of my door. The police got there within about 10 minutes. When they arrived, the man was still there, standing out front of my door. I remember them speaking to him, and I heard him claim he must be at the wrong address. He claimed he had no clue why anybody would call the police on him. He was simply trying to see his friend, Jason. I think the police knew he was lying. They basically just told him to leave me alone. They also said not to come back to my apartment building. I talked with the officers and told them what happened. They said if he came back to call them again immediately. Luckily, he did not. I never saw him again after that night, and he never attempted to follow me again either. I still can't believe how much of a creep that guy was. This took place in September of last year. I had just started working at Walmart, and someone on Instagram asked me if they could use my picture for a portrait. They told me I would get paid for it, so I said, sure, why not? I really wanted the money since my job wasn't paying me yet. They ended up sending me a fair bit, which I was pretty happy about. Not long after this, though, they asked me for some of the money back. They told me that I could keep a part of it, though. This wasn't a red flag to me yet, so I gave them the money they asked for. The next morning, I got another text from them, asking for more of the money. I told them I was getting ready for work, and they told me to send the money right now. They even tried to call me. I didn't answer. I decided to just block them. During work, I got a text from a number saying, why did you block me? I blocked that number immediately as well. As soon as I did that, I got a text from another random number. This text said something like, I'm a bad guy, and if you keep ghosting me, I'll kill your loved ones. Then I'll kill you too. They sent me three gruesome pictures of dead people. I was so scared that I texted my mom. After work, I told her I had to get a $200 Apple card to pay them, or they were going to kill me and my parents. My mom talked it over with me, and I decided to call the police instead. I told the police the entire story, and they told me they could assure nobody was coming to my house. When I asked them how they knew, they said they'd gotten many calls about this same person. Most likely, it wasn't even a person from my country. They were just attempting to extort people. I felt better after talking to the police. Afterward, I called my bank and told them about the incident as well. I asked for all the money that hadn't been approved to be sent out yet to be transferred back to me. At least I was safe, though. I was still a little shaken up. That's the scariest story I really have. Many men can be creeps. Honestly, that applies to a lot of people in general as well. When my husband was out of town for his job, 
I decided to have a garage sale with my mom and two sisters. We all lived relatively close to one another, so we just had the yard sale at my house. I had a really big front yard. None of us were selling anything really that exciting, just a bunch of stuff we had collected over the years. About an hour into the sale, a completely normal-looking man approached me. He didn't have anything in his hands to buy, so I asked him if I could help him. He replied in a very deadpan voice, No. The interaction was quite weird, but the guy seemed to be harmless. I dismissed it. Somehow, I can't seem to remember what exactly I said to him. I walked away. Not even two minutes later, though, the man approached me again. I had my back turned to him this time. I could feel him walking up behind me. All of a sudden, I heard him call out to me. Hello, dear. You have the most amazing eyes. I turned around and sort of gave this guy a half smile. I thanked him and continued walking around, trying to distance myself from this guy. He was just giving off a very unsettling vibe. I sort of felt bad for a minute, actually. What if this guy was genuinely just trying to be nice, and I was being mean to him? When he approached me the third time, he had some shirts or something in his hands. I'm sorry I was so blunt earlier. I didn't mean to offend you. I smiled and apologized for being cold. I told him it was alright. I didn't mind the compliment. I guessed I had gotten the wrong impression about him. I gave the guy an inch and he took a mile though. Oh, okay, that's good. We should go out sometime. I was pretty floored by that statement. I told the guy I was married, and I wasn't interested. He started to beg me, saying things like, Forget about your husband, I'm a real man. My personal favorite was, What even is marriage? It's just a fancy word. Now I was getting angry and somewhat annoyed. I told the man he needed to leave right now. He got angry and upset too, but left after a minute or two. About an hour later, a very pretty woman came up to me with a huge smile on her face. Hello, dear. You have the most amazing eyes. I looked at her with a little bit of disgust. She said exactly the same thing that other guy had said no more than an hour earlier. After an awkward pause where neither of us said anything, I asked if she needed any help. She just continued to look at me. You really are beautiful. I think you should forget about your husband and let me and Zachary come over. Well, this noted two things right away. One, this woman was with the guy from earlier. And two, that guy's name must be Zachary. I won't write down exactly what I said, but let's just say I said some not-so-nice words to the woman. She left without further fuss, and the rest of the afternoon went by with no issues. Honestly, though, I felt like I was looking over my shoulder every two seconds. Every time someone cleared their throat or something, I thought Zachary or his female companion would pop up behind me again. My sisters and I cleaned everything up, and I ended up going to one of my sister's houses for dinner. I just had a bad feeling about staying at home. I felt more comfortable with them, since I would be all alone if I decided to stay. We ended up having a pretty classic night together, a night we sisters hadn't shared in quite some time. We drank a bottle of wine, maybe even two, I can't really remember. Just kind of laughed and had fun all night long. At around midnight, my sister asked her husband to drive me home. Since he hadn't drank anything, and I wasn't in the right mind to drive my own car, the drive was only three minutes from driveway to driveway, if we had left 30 seconds later, the night may have ended much differently for me. As we were driving down the road, my brother-in-law suddenly asked me a question. Hey, who is that? Is that someone at your house? I sat up and noticed the garage door was wide open. Not the overhead door, mind you. The normal one. I kept that door locked 100% of the time. He pulled into the bottom of the driveway and told me not to get out yet. We couldn't have been sitting for more than 10 seconds when all of a sudden a light went on inside the house. This bright light in the living room illuminated the whole entire front of the home. I didn't take any chances. I immediately called the police. My brother-in-law stayed there with me until they showed up. 
It took about five minutes for them to get there, and during that time, we watched the intruders shine this bright light throughout the house. When the cops finally arrived, they must have seen the flashing lights outside because they fled out the garage door as fast they could. Two officers chased them, and another came over to talk to me. A few minutes passed by, and the cops came back. They had been unsuccessful in their foot chase. When they fled from my home, it was easy to tell the two intruders were that woman from earlier, and the same creep as well. I told the cops everything I could think of, their descriptions, basically all of it. I went inside with my brother-in-law. They hadn't stolen anything. All they'd done was smash all our photos, including me and my husband's wedding picture. That was it. Everything else had been left completely untouched. That only made things all the more unnerving. I had no idea who these people were, or why they wanted me so badly in particular. I slept at my sister's house until my husband came home from his trip. The day after, I installed several security cameras around the house. Thankfully, those two never came back and attempted to grab me, though. I truly hope that whatever they wanted that evening remains a mystery for the rest of time. So, this just happened to me a few weeks ago now, and honestly, I can't really believe it. It just seems surreal to me that some people out there are just plain evil. There isn't really any rhyme or reason to their actions. As I said, this was only a few weeks ago now. My family and I had a yard sale to kind of purge away a lot of the unnecessary clutter and stuff we didn't need anymore. For the most part, everything was perfectly fine. There were a couple of minor hiccups along the way, but nothing really that crazy. At some point during the day, I noticed a strange older man, though. This guy was at least in his 60s, honestly, maybe even much older. He was browsing the yard sale like everyone else, but I noticed him right away. He stuck out like a sore thumb. He was bald on top but had this wild white hair that shot out on each side of his head. To give you a mental image, he kind of looked like Albert Einstein, except more dirty looking. I try not to judge a book by its cover, but something about the way this guy was behaving was a little bit strange. After a few minutes of browsing, but not particularly looking at anything, I started to keep my eye on him. That's when I noticed his weird behavior even more. It became clear to me that he wasn't actually looking at anything on sale. Instead, he seemed to be observing my home itself. He looked down at something I had on the table. Then he would look up and examine my house. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence. But I noticed this behavior again and again and again. I tried not to let my imagination run wild but it was really hard to ignore. Things started getting busy and I lost focus on the guy for a few minutes. When I finally regained it and located this man, he was near my front window. He appeared to be peeking inside my home. I decided that this was enough. I confronted the man and told him he was getting too close to my property, that he needed to leave if he wasn't going to buy anything at the yard sale. I remember the look he gave me in that moment. It was this really unsettling, murderous expression. He then turned around and walked away. He left my yard sale and walked down the street. He ended up standing at the end of it for several minutes. I would regularly look up, and when I did, the strange man was still standing there, looking at me. Finally, after I don't know how long, I didn't see the man any longer. I eventually forgot about him, and the rest of the day continued with no further issues. That night, I was telling my girlfriend about this weird guy. She jumped up right away and said she knew exactly who I was talking about. She said that she had noticed him too. He was really creeping her out, and that wasn't really surprising to me. She told me that she had been helping an older woman bring a chair out to her car, and while she was walking back, she saw him skulking about the side of the house. She was confused in that moment, but kind of forgot about it not long after. 
she'd just assumed in the moment that he was a lost old man wandering around. She didn't think it was harmful in any way. As weird as it was, we talked a little more that night and decided to simply go to bed. I did double check all the locks one last time though, just in case. At about two in the morning, my girlfriend and I were both jolted wide awake by a loud noise. It was the sound of a loud bang, followed by screaming. It sounded like it was right out her window. She clutched the blanket in fear, and I got up to see what was happening. I saw my neighbor was chasing someone down the street with what appeared to be something in their hand, probably a baseball bat. My neighbor was screaming. The memory of him screaming to call 911 is still burned in my head to this day. I ran outside to make sure everything was alright. By the time I got there, my neighbor was already walking back, huffing and puffing. A minute or two after he walked back over, the cops pulled up as well. My neighbor called them over. I was standing next to him. I wanted to be supportive of my neighbor. Little did I know he was going to drop the ultimate nightmare on me. I thought my neighbor had caught some type of potential intruder, but what he said was much worse. My neighbor was talking to the officer. He said he was sitting in his garage smoking a cigarette when he noticed a floodlight across the street turn on. Being a somewhat nosy neighbor, he looked up and saw a man trying to break into a window. I felt like throwing up because the window he pointed at was my bedroom window. I immediately dropped back and asked him to clarify further. After confirming he meant my house, I fell to my knees. In that moment, I was extremely grateful to have a nosy neighbor. My neighbor gave the officer a description of the man. The night just kept on getting worse. Just like I said earlier, he described that same guy, Albert Einstein looking, which was very distinct. I told the officer about the man's weird behavior earlier at the yard sale. The police took both our statements and went on with their night. As of me writing this account, they still haven't caught the old man. My girlfriend and I both barely sleep anymore. Every noise I hear outside now causes me to jump out of my skin. Sometimes when I can't fall asleep, I find myself just sitting in the garage, waiting to see him walk by again. I'm planning on proposing to my girlfriend soon, and after that we'll be moving out of this neighborhood for good. I'm worried I may not get a decent night's sleep as long as I'm still living in that house. I'm a female and used to be a trainer at a gym for a very short length of time. I didn't do it for very long and I moved on to other things. It was a nice career while it lasted though. When I was a trainer, I had a male client who I'll call Dave. I met Dave for his first training session at the gym that I worked at. He was a couple years older than me and seemed to be in decent shape. He said he didn't have much experience with working out and wanted to gain some muscle. I had a meeting with him which went pretty well. During our first training session at the gym though, everything went wrong. He made some comments during the workout as if he was attempting to hit on me. I did my best to look past them and tried to keep him focused on the workout. Dave didn't seem to be interested in the workout at all though, more so just with me. I was beginning to wonder if he wanted me to be his personal trainer just because he was into me. There were at least five different times in the first session alone when he said something that would really raise someone's eyebrows. When it was over, I wanted to drop him as a client. I decided to give him one more opportunity though. We were supposed to meet several days later, but we didn't even get there. Now, I would give my phone number to all my clients. This was for communication so we could text and if they had any questions about diet or recovery or things like that, they could ask me at any time. Well, as you might imagine, Dave took advantage of this to send me inappropriate texts all the time. He even asked me to come over to his place. 
It was at that point I decided I was not going to work with him any longer. I told him that and he didn't seem to think he'd done anything wrong. He told me I was being too sensitive. After he kept texting me, I blocked his number. I didn't want to have to deal with this guy anymore. The next day, I went to work at the gym. I had other clients that I was training. I went through a full day with all of them. I didn't see Dave anywhere at all. When I got off work though, I left and was walking to my car in the parking lot. That was when I noticed a car parked nearby mine, which was all the way at the back of the lot. Dave was standing outside the car, leaning against it. By that point, I was about halfway there. He was already looking at me. I felt like it was too late to go back, so I kept walking forward. Dave approached me in front of my car and asked me what my problem was. I told him he had crossed the line and I just wanted to leave and go home. He tried to stop me. He stood in front of my car door and asked me what my problem was again. I told him that confronting me like this in the middle of the parking lot was only making things even worse for him. He got real angry and didn't move. That's when I threatened to call the police. At that point, he finally left me alone. For the next week or so, I was paranoid. Every time I walked back to my car after work, I thought I would see him there waiting for me. Luckily though, I never did see him again. This happened years ago, back in high school. I was an athlete in high school, and I played on both the football and baseball teams. It was my dream to play college sports, and I did end up playing college football for a bit. During my time in high school, I had to train to get a lot better though. I had a good friend named Miles, whose parents were kind of rich. We lived in an area with a little bit more space. Miles' parents had a large property, out in their backyard and to the side of their house, they had an old barn next to the woods that had been converted into a field house. Honestly, it was one of the coolest things I had ever seen. They put in a turf area, bad treadmills, they even had some weights as well. Two benches and a squat rack. There were batting cages and lots of other stuff. It was a dream come true for a high school athlete like myself. So, during off-seasons in the wintertime when it would snow and stuff, we would go in there and train the whole day practically. Miles and I got into a real habit. Between November and March, on school days, we would work out every day before classes. That would usually be about 5.30 to 6 a.m. Then, we would head to school. One morning, I got up at about 5.30 and headed to his house. He only lived a couple miles away. When I got there, I met him at his home, and we walked out to the field house together. Inside, it was mostly one large space, but there was a bathroom and a storage closet. The batting cages were kind of around the corner. There was lots of various sports equipment around the sides as well. Miles and I started working out. We were mostly in the weight room area. Not long after I started, though, I heard a strange noise from around the corner somewhere near the batting cages. It was even more strange because Miles was right next to me. I thought maybe it could be Miles' dad or perhaps his brother, and they were in the gym without us knowing. Miles stopped and asked me if I'd just heard that. I asked him if his dad or brother was supposed to be in there. He said no. That's when I started to get a bad feeling about this. We decided to go investigate and walked over to the batting cages where we'd heard the noise. The storage closet was next to the batting cages. We could hear that the noise was coming from within there. Miles quietly opened the door and looked inside. He then jumped back in surprise. I didn't see it at first, but I soon noticed a random guy we'd never seen before. He was in there looking at us. He started to stand up grabbing a hockey stick from among the supplies. We both moved away from the man and ran towards the front doors. The man emerged, holding his hockey stick at the ready and walking in our direction. 
He had a messy looking beard and was balding. That's all I really remember about him. Miles and I ran from the field house back to his house. We made it inside where his parents were in the kitchen. We told them about this random man. They called the police and we waited for them to arrive. About five minutes later, they went to the field house and surprisingly, the man was still there. They were able to arrest him after he apparently tried to attack the officers. I think the guy must have been crazy or something. I later found out he was on some sort of drugs and had been staying at a neighbor's place. He'd roamed through the woods until he found the field house. Miles' younger brother had forgotten to shut the back door the previous night and the man had simply walked right in. I'm glad he didn't really attempt to hurt us with that hockey stick. He could have done some real damage had he decided to chase us further than he did. That was probably the craziest thing to ever happen to me in high school. This was the strangest and most unsettling thing that's ever happened to me. It was last year and I just finished a long semester at school. Before the holiday break, I had been quite tired and stressed, and I couldn't wait to get home and decompress for a little while before heading back to school. On the drive home, I was planning on staying at a hotel overnight, then finishing the rest of the drive in the morning. I don't know if I got a second wind or if I was just hopped up on all the Red Bull I was drinking, but I decided to drive straight through instead of wasting the money on a hotel room. If I remember correctly, it was around 3 in the morning. I started to get really tired. I was doing that thing where your head keeps dropping, no matter how hard you're trying to stay awake. I could feel myself swerving all over the road. I knew I was never going to make it. I told myself I was going to pull over at the next rest area, but I would never even make it that far. I dozed off a little too hard while driving and lost control of the car for a split second. That was a second too long though. I ended up driving straight through a guardrail and my car got wedged into a ditch on the side of the highway. I sat there in disbelief for a moment. That was the scariest moment of my entire life. Little did I know it was about to get so much worse. Once I realized I was alright, I tried to back up out of the ditch. It appeared to be hopeless. I was not getting anywhere. I was dreading calling for help, but I knew it needed to be done. While I was digging for my phone that had been thrown onto the floor somewhere due to the accident, someone suddenly came up from behind and knocked on my window, much like a cop might do. I nearly jumped out of my seat when I realized it wasn't a cop at all. I asked what this random guy wanted. The window was still closed completely. Instead of answering me, the man just stared inside with this creepy look on his face. He started to bang on the window with his fist, and I began yelling at him and telling him to go away. He just kept knocking, and when he saw how scared I was getting, he got this wide smile on his face. This went on for a while, and I yelled at him the entire time. He never changed the rhythm of his banging, nor how hard he was slamming the glass. At one point, I was just begging for him to stop, but he kept going like some sort of machine. I could see him just staring in at me. Eventually, he ran in front of my car and just stood there. That's when I got a better look at him. He was about six feet tall if I had to make a guess, and was wearing a white shirt, shorts, and sandals. This was even though it was under 45 degrees outside. I couldn't tell exactly what it was, but it looked like he had some sort of tattoo on his right leg as well. What was I supposed to do here? Get out and confront this guy? I'd get stabbed or something. Yeah, I don't think so. I wasn't going to play around any longer. I called the police and told them what happened. I told them about the creepy man as well banging on my window and standing in front of my car. Maybe two minutes had gone by at most. I did say that he didn't really do anything besides knock on my window. Now he was just kind of looking at me. The dispatcher didn't seem too concerned. 
just told me to wait there with the doors locked, and somebody would be there shortly. The entire time I waited, the man didn't move at all. He just stood there about three feet from my car, looking in with this terrible smile. He didn't break his gaze once, not even for one second. Ten minutes later, the cops finally pulled up behind me. The crazed man immediately took off running into the night. The cop came over to my window and asked me to get out of the car. I was frantically trying to explain that the guy had just run away, but the cop didn't seem too concerned. He just kept telling me to relax. He actually shushed me like I was a small child or something. Instead of chasing the guy, he claimed he hadn't seen anyone there and asked me if I was drinking or using any other types of extracurricular substances. I was outraged. I may have said a few things I shouldn't have, and ended up having a very unpleasant conversation with the officer, who made me take a field sobriety test. He eventually helped me out of the ditch and followed me to a gas station. I filled up on gas and checked the damage on my car. I also grabbed a coffee as well. For the rest of the drive, he didn't even attempt to take my statement, saying, what am I supposed to do, find a guy with sandals on? I got the distinct impression he thought I was making up that story about the guy. After that night, I never drove tired again. To this day, I still wonder who the hell that guy was. I mean, I know he didn't want anything specifically. Clearly, he wasn't all right in the head. I just mean I wondered what he intended. What if I did open the door? What if my phone was broken in the crash? Most importantly, where did that guy even come from? I mean, there were no other cars around. He literally just appeared out of nowhere after the crash. I have to believe those are some crazy odds. I know it's weird, but I still lose sleep thinking about that all the time. What would this guy have done if he was able to get to me? I have my own theories, but I don't think I can even begin to share them. Last year was the first time I truly encountered an evil person. I didn't really think people like that existed. This is going to sound very ignorant, but I was of the mindset at the time that if something bad happened to you, then you were probably in a situation where you shouldn't have been. Obviously, that's not including accidents, though. Well, I totally changed my stance on that opinion after last year. Horrible people that do bad things because they want to do exist. If you take anything from this story that I'm about to tell you, just remember to always be careful and alert, especially around people you don't know anything about. I was house-sitting and pet-sitting for a very close friend of mine. She and her husband were taking a weekend getaway for their anniversary. They lived in a mostly secluded area where there wasn't much going on. Honestly, I kind of liked that about it. This was like a getaway weekend for me. I did some errands during the day and turned in early for the night. I made some chili and planned on just watching some movies with the dog all night. A little after 8 p.m. though, the doorbell rang. It actually scared me. Even the dog looked pretty spooked. I could tell this place didn't get very many visitors, especially at this time of night. I slowly answered the door to see who it was. There was a security door in front of it that was still locked. I opened the main door and the dog started barking and going crazy. I was surprised at what I was looking at. You see, it was a young man probably just reaching his twenties. He had shaggy hair but was pretty clean shaven. He was rocking two diamond earring studs and was wearing grey sweatpants and a grey t-shirt. I muttered my way through asking the question, Can I help you? This young guy looked scared, terrified even, almost sad. He asked if I had any heavy straps. I was confused by that question. I think the guy could tell I had no idea what he was talking about. He went on to explain that his car had gone off the road nearby and was now stuck in the mud. He needed some straps to help pull his car out. I politely told the kid that I didn't have any such thing. I closed the door, but part of me felt really bad for him. 
I knew myself, though, and knew I wouldn't have been much help in such a situation. Not to mention, we really didn't have any heavy straps in the house. I really, really doubted it. I finished watching an episode of The Office. I was getting ready to go to bed. It wasn't that late, but in my older age, it may as well have been 3 o'clock in the morning. Just as I was shutting off the lights, the doorbell rang again. This time, the dog started to bark right away. She must have known something wasn't right. Before approaching the door, I looked at the time on the stove. It was 11.13. I looked through the small window next to the door. It was the same young guy as before. Now, I was frustrated and angry. I was about to tell the guy to get off the property when he said, Please, sir, I'm sorry to bother you again, but nobody else in the neighborhood will answer the door. My phone's dead. I've almost got the car out. I just need a little push. Can you please come and help me? I'll give you some money. I was beyond annoyed, but I could hear the anxiety in this kid's voice. I must have been really tired because I agreed to help the kid out. I know that sounds crazy, but I don't know. At the moment, it seemed like the right thing to do. The guy was excited and started to thank me profusely. We started making our way down the dark and not very populated street. I could see about a hundred yards down the road. A small car really was off the side. The guy pointed ahead and said that was his car just up there. While I was walking, it dawned on me that I could have and should have just called the police to help this guy out. I noticed that I didn't even have my phone in my pocket to call the police, in case we couldn't get the car out of the ditch. As we were closing in, I looked down. Even in the darkness, I could see the ground was not muddy at all. I started having second thoughts. How was his car stuck in the mud if there was no mud around? Once I was standing next to it, I looked at the tires. I noticed the car didn't look stuck at all. Before I could even ask any questions, a large man who was significantly older than the guy at the door jumped out from behind the car. He grabbed me and tackled me to the ground. He started to beat my face and then demanded I hand over my phone and wallet right now. I guess the joke was on him looking back because I'd left my phone and wallet in the house since I didn't think this was going to take long. I was able to tell that information to the man who looked immediately angry. He couldn't rob me now. He ripped off my smartwatch, which again, the joke was on him. It was just some $30 cheap knockoff that looked like an Apple watch. After taking my cheap watch, they jumped into the car and drove off into the night. I ran back to the house and called the police. I did the best I could to describe the car and the man who actually attacked me. I didn't really get a good look at either though, especially since it was so dark out. I was able to give a decent description of the younger guy, but I don't know how much that really helped. As far as I know, they never caught them, and if they did, it was not because of me. I told my friend and her husband about the events, and they said they'd never experienced anything like that before or since. Like I said in the beginning, this really changed me. I know firsthand now that terrible people really are out there and they truly do want to hurt you for no reason. So be careful and don't trust people just because they look innocent. I was driving home to Pennsylvania from Canada with some friends in tow. Well, really I wasn't driving. I was more chilling in the back seat. We were cruising at about 80 miles per hour on the interstate. At about 3 in the morning, all of a sudden out of nowhere, this nearly naked woman appeared in the headlights, slowly shuffling down the white center line. We missed her by mere inches. I turned around and saw her in the red lights of our brakes. She looked absolutely terrified. We swerved off the shoulder about a quarter mile up the road, wondering if this person was dangerous or perhaps a victim of some crime. Would it be safe to approach her and try to get her off the road? We slowly reversed while calling 911 to report this. Our plan was to follow her for a bit and see if she needed help. We didn't want someone to come along and kill her or something. 
When we got back to the area where we'd seen her, though, she was gone. We had no idea where she went to. Heck, we had no evidence she was even real, or if she was simply a late-night hallucination. Even miles later, when we pulled off at a gas station to use the restroom, everyone was too scared to step out into the night. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now guys, so thank you so much for watching and I hope you guys have a great day.